You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. My name is Terrence Doyle. And I'm Chris Lopez. You probably know us from the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Right Along Show. Well, now we're talking everything multifamily. We bring in top industry experts from around the country to come join us in our Denver studio for an in-depth, in-person conversation. We're gonna be diving deep into deals, underwriting, raising capital, and everything in between. Join the conversation. What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to season two of the Multifamily Show on Bigger Pockets YouTube. We've got Van and Kyle back from season one in Denver. We got a new format for the show too, Terrence. What are we doing? Our boys from Texas are back. Uh, the format for season two I'm really excited about is going to be the first part in the studio. We're going to go over their backgrounds and a deal. It's going to be 15 to 20 minutes, right? So we're going to shorten it. It's going to be power packed. And then the second episode of every guest is going to be in the field, highlighting something they're really good at. So Van and Kyle, we're going to be having them sit down with two of the most su su sophisticated and successful investors in Denver that I know personally, and they're going to pitch them a deal and we're going to pick it apart, see what they did well, give them some constructive feedback and for the audience, get to see what it looks like to pitch some sophisticated institutional investors. So make sure you check out this video, part two, and most importantly, like, comment, subscribe, and hit us up. We love reading the comments. All right, so let's jump right into it. You guys have been busy this year. We were just talking that you guys were here eight, nine months ago. And tell us, give us a little brief background for those of you that did not watch season one. And then let's talk about what you guys have been up to the last nine months. Yeah, absolutely. So background, um, you know, grew up in Texas, played soccer, not from a super wealthy family, so kind of knew that if we were going to go to college, it was going to be on soccer scholarship or something of that nature, so ended up making that happen. Went out to UC Davis, uh, played Division One soccer out there for two years, was studying pre-med, was trying to be you know, a, a doctor because people told me that that paid well. I didn't really think if I liked that or that's something that I was passionate about. I was just like, oh, people think you're doing well if you're a doctor. Yep. So I, uh, I I went and did that. Um, and then two years in, I, I just kind of didn't like soccer as much at that point because it's so much a job at that level because everyone is so talented. And I was just starting to be like, I think I kind of want something else in my life. I don't necessarily want to have to have all these gatekeepers where like my efforts not directly rewarded so if I train really hard in the off season and I come back and have like just better fitness numbers than other people in, in preseason testing it doesn't really matter because it's about how you fit in the team system and the coach has to make political decisions and also personnel decisions how you fit with other people and there's a lot of uh, gatekeeping there same thing with you know med school if you want to be a doctor or you want to be a psychologist or you want to do something you have to go through the eight years of training and I'm actually kind of glad that surgeons in America have to go through that much school but I personally just didn't want to deal with the the gatekeeping and I was like can you be an entrepreneur is that something you can do can you can you kind of hop skip and jump over a lot of these barriers and uh I read a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, my sophomore year of college, and I was like, yeah, this is it. We're doing this. You know, I'll sleep in my car. I want to live like this. I want to I wanna be my, I want to control my own destiny. I want to have that responsibility. I want to have to take action and be rewarded for my results. And I'll, I, I'll, lose, I'll live and die by my efforts. Like, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, if I come out and my effort's not there and I fail, fantastic. I can live with that. But I just don't want to work hard and then not see the fruits of that labor. That is extremely frustrating to me. And so... Uh, I dropped out my sophomore year. Uh, I did a bunch of networking, went to local meetups, grinded it out. Um, and in six months, I was able to raise money for a 107 unit deal in Kentucky and then a 12 unit deal in Atlanta. And then now we're doing the Scion Capital stuff. Yeah, so I love that. I mean, I think one of the things that stood out to me when I met you uh, uh, 12 months ago, 14 months ago, something like that, was just you, you went for it. You, know, you read that book. You started going to meetups. I think even one meetup, you're like the janitor, you're cleaning up, you're arranging chairs, you're doing whatever it took just to add value to be part of the community and the conversation. And then quickly that led to you raising money. And as a sophomore, junior in college, you know, you were part of a uh, hundred unit syndication. And that's incredible. You know, that that's like, there's so many people out there that want to get into real estate. And if they just take action, look for ways to add value, they can be part of it. So that's amazing. I love that. We're going to unpack your story a little bit more later. Van, your turn. Yeah. So I think I have a pretty similar story to Kyle. Um, we were kind of following similar parallel paths at the same time without actually knowing it. Um, but I was in college studying engineering, had no idea why I was there. Like I would tell you that it was because I wanted money. But funny enough, when I was 18, picking my college major, I didn't even care about money. I just figured I'm good at math. I like cars. I guess I'll major in engineering. Um, but I was always horrible at school. And what I didn't, 
I was not ready for the train that was about to hit me, which is like engineering at UT Austin, which is like a top 10 school. Brutal. And so after like failing a few classes, I finally got an opportunity sophomore year to go work. And so I was like, sweet, I can take off. I'm not going to have homework. I can just go make money, not have homework. And that just like kept popping into my head. And then I get to Dallas uh, and it's a nine month internship. So I took a full semester off and I was going to work January through August um, working full time. And then like two days in, I was super stoked to not have schoolwork, to not even be logging into my school account and all that stuff. And then like two or three days in, I was just freaking out because I would go to work. It was okay. And then I'd get home. I'd like eat a snack, go to the gym, get home, like do the dishes, go to bed. And just after three days of that, I called my mom and I was like, how do people do this? I was like, when do I get to go on a walk at 11 a.m. again? Like I was just freaking out. And um, so at that point, I quickly started. I had always kind of had an entrepreneurial bug in me, but I had no reason to ever pursue it because, I mean, I came from definitely not a wealthy family, but I mean, grew up in a wealthy area. I had a lot of opportunity, went to a good school. Um, and so even though my parents didn't understand money, I had no reason to either. Um, and so then I started doing all sorts of crazy stuff, day trading, like flipping all sorts of weird things, drop shipping stores, whatever I could do to try to get some, my hands on some money and like try to separate my time from my money in some way, which I don't think I knew I was doing at the time, but eventually I kind of learned that from rich dad, poor dad as well. But, um, after making some money, losing more money, doing all sorts of weird stuff, I fell into real estate. Um, and I was just in YouTube university, reading books, doing everything I could to learn about it. And I, it seemed a little safer to me for whatever reason, after, after you get burned on a couple bad trades and you're in the red and you hear the long-term wealth building pitch of real estate, you're like, okay, maybe that makes sense. It, it allows me to be high risk without actually being high risk. And so, uh, then I made it my goal to, okay, I'm going to take all this internship money, go buy a duplex, rent it out to one of my buddies, live in the other half, finish college. Um, do that. And at the time I kind of had this like pipe dream of doing it full time, but I figured, okay, this will just be like a hobby. Cause that's, I was watching a lot of bigger pockets at the time. And I was like, okay, I get a duplex this year. Then I'll get a fourplex the next year. And here's my, my roadmap. And then I actually made an Excel sheet and went in and I was like, wait, I'm going to be 40. I can't do that. Like I need to figure something else out. Um, and then that's when, right before I was about to close on the duplex, I saw Kyle on LinkedIn doing syndication and I didn't know what that was. And so we met up, he had just closed the 119 unit or 107 unit and uh as well as a 12 unit so we meet up and i'm like dude what's going on like i'm sick there's no way you're sicker than me what's going on here and he's like no you can raise money from other people and close a deal and so i got a weird little competitive fire lit under me um and and so i started going to meetups doing a similar thing and this was like february of 2020 so i had like a month or two of going around putting myself out there before everything went online and that was actually a huge blessing because then I got to, I was in every meetup across the U.S. because I was just hopping on Zoom calls, talking to all these people, going on LinkedIn, talking to everyone I could to try to get in on a deal, learning as much as I could. Um, and eventually I met a partner and we ended up raising money for a deal. So we put together a little fund, raised money for a deal, and that was my ticket into the general partnership. So it was a 300 unit in uh, North Carolina. And that's what kind of put me on the map as far as like talking to brokers and other investors and helping to raise money in the future and stuff. Um, and so after that, uh, you know, me and Kyle were having this parallel success. We we're hanging out. We're friends. We're like, dude, what are we doing? Because we didn't want to work together. And then we're like, okay, we have to. And so eventually we said, hey, let's do this. Let's why, beat the why, asset. I mean, talk about that because you're, you're mixing yeah. friendship and partner, you know, friendship mm -hmm. and business, which, which can be amazing um, or the opposite. Well, exa so, and I, yeah, what's what's the thought process on there? Yeah, that's what we were scared of because yeah. we were um, like after we realized, OK, we're similar dudes that, you know, we have a lot of the same drives and ambitions and stuff. But we didn't want to do that because we're like, dude, business is weird. Money's weird. We don't want to like introduce that. Um, but eventually we're hanging out at church together. We're spending all our time together. And we're like, dude, this is something we have to do. Like, I don't it almost feels like a like a disservice to not do this. Um, and so we came together and realized that we can probably build something bigger than, you know, like we can make one plus one equal three in a sense. And so that's what we're trying to do now with Zion Capital. But yeah, it's been an absolutely beautiful journey. So one of the things that I think is interesting is you guys were like rising stars in the syndication world. You guys were like 19, 20, 21 years old in Texas in a super hot market, had worked with some other operators around the country. And it's kind of like the entry level position, like, hey, we're going to bring these guys on. They're going to help us go raise money. They're good at social media. They're good at marketing. So you guys had a lot of opportunity to go work with other more established companies. 
help us understand and walk the audience through why you guys chose to start Zion Capital versus going to work for somebody else more established? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. The reason for me starting Zion Capital was since we, our whole ambition always was, I want to learn how to control real estate. I want to learn how to manage and operate and be an asset manager because that's where the value is. I mean, if you, and even in the negotiation table, like you can beat up a capital raiser and it happens all the time. Unfortunately, me and Van probably both got beat up in our first negotiations on how much DP are we getting for raising this money? They're like, well, we got six guys behind you who can do the same thing as you. Uh, and we found the deal and we're operating it. So you're going to get what we give you. You know what I mean? And, and like that, that's great when you're starting and you got to take the punches or whatever. But we kind of saw like, I would much rather be in their position than my position. And if I can get in the GP and then learn all their systems, be involved in all their phone calls and learn how they're doing this, which is what we both did, um, then we can take their systems and we can learn all the things from them and we can go and try to do it ourselves. And we just started realizing like, we're never gonna figure this out unless we do it ourselves. Um, We're getting a lot of great knowledge, but like, let's just jump off the cliff and try to figure this out. Um, And let's try to actually understand the intrinsically valuable skill of managing a company in the form of real estate because that's what you can take that anywhere. I mean, we could go start a T-shirt business and do really well now because we understand P&L. We know how to set really good goals for our team and make sure that they're delivering. We know how to keep track of things. We have good systems and spreadsheets and we have weekly meetings and we nail like projections like that. And that's the skill we wanted to learn, you know, because communication and talking to investors and raising capital, you're only valuable in relation to the people you know. And so that's great for time, but I, I always kind of got this fear of like, well, what's going to stop this guy from being like, okay, cool, you introduced me to the guy who's got the skill set, the actual skill set of investing and picking deals and running them, and you just made the intro. I got the money. He's got the skills. Why are you here again? You know, after a couple of deals, it's, it's just a commodity. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So you guys, we did the, we recorded a podcast here. You guys had not started it yet. You guys were like talking to a bunch of different people and had a, multiple options. So you start Zion Capital right after you leave. And then you guys start looking at deals and sitting here today, it's the end of August, 2021. You guys have closed two deals on your own. So walk us through what that looked like starting the company, raising money on your own, where you guys are the sponsor. You had virtually very little track record. Mm -hmm. Like walk us through that, how that went down and all the challenges that came along with that. Yeah. So it, it materialized. Um, I think it was November, December, uh, when Kyle and I were thinking like, dude, we need to come together and like do this on our own. Um, and we toured Ryan Smith, who owns a really big fund, Elevation Fund. Um, he was in Austin touring his self-storage. And so me and Kyle came down and we went and just walked with him. We didn't really, we just wanted to meet a dude with, you know, 500 employees and like billions under management. And we're like, let's just try to learn. And we're walking around. He's got in-house management for the self-storage and we're just watching him run this company and we're like dude this is what we have to do the funny like, thing about that is we were the only ones who showed up too he put that on social media <laughs> yeah. a, a nine-figure man said anyone can come to this and tour it with me and me and van were the only two people that showed no up way. the Seriously? only so now me and van are walking the guy's self-storage unit him his property manager and he's a nine-figure guy and he's walking us through telling us everything and we're like giving you all kinds of a like private tour yeah. Huh? Yeah, we're getting a private he, he, tour we're so, getting like the highest level like oh you know higher soul fire fat like all this stuff of just like whoa, this is how you run a company. What, what jumped out like, to you? Like, you know, like a bigger two, you know, like a takeaway or a couple The fact big that takeaways. he knew what kind of flooring they were going to put on a self-storage unit in Austin when he owns all around the country, and thousands and thousands. Lives in Florida. Oh, and I'm going to Nashville to check out our portfolio tomorrow. Uh, so this guy is basically living in a great life and then traveling all around the country to see his stuff. And he knows every detail. And we were like, that's that's a skill. Yeah, I, I like, think that's valuable. I, I think control can be glorified, but like seeing his level of control and understanding that he knows what's going on in all of his assets. He's, he literally was on like a three-month tour of just traveling the country with his family, checking out his assets, walking around, hands in his pocket, just running a damn business. And we're like, that's what we want to do. Um, so anyway, that's that's what really like made it pop. And so we actually had lost on a few deals. Um, by the time we did that podcast in January, we'd gotten to best and final, lost a few deals. Um, and so it was kind of almost awkward in our head because we're like, dude, we need, we're need, we supposed to have a deal. And then the week after that podcast, we went under contract on the 42 unit that we got. And that deal, it was a little rough. It needed a little bit of tender love and care. Um, it was a very low cap, but we said, you know, like this is what we cut our teeth on. This is in a good market. We know the market. Like other people don't want to touch us. Someone in California is not going to want to touch a two cap or whatever it is. Um, but we get in there and that's when we said, okay, like let's make this happen. We knew we had raised the money before. We put the team together um, and we got the deal closed. And I, I think 
like even though we were capital raisers we got to see how the sausage was made but we weren't making it and so at that point that's when we really just jumped in and that's when you know we had never talked directly to lenders before you know even though we had negligible balance sheets relative to the size of the loan we signed on the loan like we we did all the stuff we're hands-on with the deal and at the end of it we were like man that was not bad at all. So that and first deal was forty-two units. Yeah. And how much? How much was the purchase price? Four point seven. Four point seven. So a little over a hundred a door, which nothing in Denver trades for a hundred a door anymore. Yeah, same. So Austin is kind of like Denver. So that seems like a really low basis. And how much equity did you have to raise? So we raised one point nine million, and then uh, before we closed, we appraised for five. So three hundred k equity. Nice. And front. what would you say to those people? Because I think the capital gets very scary to people. And I'm sure like nine months ago saying, hey, you need to raise 1.9 million probably wasn't very comfortable mm -hmm. for you guys because you hadn't raised, done that before. Yeah. I mean, talk about maybe one or two takeaways from raising 1.9 million and what your advice would be to someone sitting there that's like, I want to go do a $5 million deal in my market and I'm going to need to raise. I, mean, I have a good story on it. I mean, the one thing I want to say, the biggest takeaway is you're never going to be ready and like, we have a, like yeah. a tangible example of that. We had to put down $47,000 earnest money deposit on this deal and a $35,000 loan deposit. That's happening like three days in, right? <laughs> right? Like we get contract accepted. We have three days to do this. We have a situation with earnest money not really making sense and we have nowhere to go. So we have two days to basically fall out of this contract and we have, you know, what is that? Eight, almost 80 grand that we obviously don't have at that time. And uh, we meet with a guy that we met on LinkedIn two weeks before at Cheesecake for lunch like uh, 24 hours before this money is due and we tell the guy uh you know we probably over talk we're like oh, we really this is what we want to do this is our dream like we can do this we can pull this off like you, all this stuff and he's like he just like sits back super calm he's like sure and we're like you're you're gonna do this you're gonna wire the eighty thousand dollars tonight and he's like yeah let's do it let's make it happen oh yeah to, to backpedal like the week before we go get lunch with this guy i i was doing something Kyle. i was like hey i'm gonna go get lunch uh with this dude he's like a syndicator i guess um we sit down and we're just thinking of him as an LP. And so we're like sitting, eating, and he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm in for 100. And we're like, nice, fist bump, walk out of the restaurant, raise 100K, cool, like we'll keep going. And so we've known this guy for like seven weeks, or seven days, sorry. And now he's, you know, one of our key, he's our key partner. Right. Great partner, awesome to work with. Like we have this relationship with Joel now. Um, but we literally sit down with him and go, hey, we need you to an wire advance. We need advance on the 100. <laughs> yeah, we need 100K, like, now tonight yeah. with, and he's like mm, okay sure i'm like, going to arizona I'll, yeah. i'm flying to arizona tomorrow morning i'll wire tonight we're like okay yeah. so like i'll never forget the car ride to that meeting and the car ride back from that meeting <laughs> right, and yeah. like i think people think like because i always get questions from this online or in my coaching program where people are like oh how do i line up earnest money because that's gonna come like three days in and how am i gonna you know make sure that i feel confident with the 1.9 million it's like you kind of have to say yes and figure it out. And I know that's like the hardest thing to hear, but that's literally what happens. Like I've never, I've never had anything lined up. Like it's never worked that way. It's kind of stressful. Well, what did you have prepared so that he, cause at the sound, the story sounds amazing, but you guys actually had work done and you guys were prepared so that someone could wire Like you guys had docs in place. You guys had a deck. I mean, what were the things that you had in place to where someone that likes you, trusts you and understands the market and the opportunity can say, yeah, I'll do it. So that's the interesting thing. That's what made me smile when you first asked this question is people do not care about anything other than the fact that it's off market and it's in Austin. And it's 110 a door. Yeah. And so when, when we tell people, because no one can find anything that competitive at all, as soon as anything goes to market, which of course most stuff does, it gets bid up 20%. And so we, we came to him and we said, hey, you know, we have a good relationship with this broker. He likes us for whatever reason. He throws his bone. Uh, we have this thing off market, you know, kind of a lazy California seller, like do you want in? And he was like, yeah, I haven't seen one of these. Let's do it. Yeah. And then as we were raising money from LPs, people, you can tell a story about uh, one of our LPs, but like people didn't care. They saw Austin. They wanted in. One it, of the things, and Chris, you know, Chris and I have been talking about deals for, I don't know, four years now. And you've seen almost most of the multifamily deals I've done here. Mm -hmm. None of them make sense on paper. Almost none of them make sense on paper the day I buy them. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, but it's the fact that I know what it's going to produce once it's built. Right. If you can understand people, the entire most of the market falls in love with this term cap rate and cash on cash day one. And to find a real deal that's off market, th none of that's going to be there. Right. I mean, most of the deals that we buy are 50 percent below market rent and maybe 30 or 40 percent vacancy. So they look horrible on paper. They look horrible on, on paper, horrible on paper. Right. So and I think that's the punchline for the audience is that 
you have to be able to look at it from a different perspective. If you just look the way everyone else is underwriting deals, it's going to be really, really difficult, and you're probably not going to get disproportionate returns to the risk. But if you're able to like change the way you look at a deal, the way that you guys are talking about it, even on your first deal, you're like, hey, look, the cap rate doesn't make sense, the cash flow doesn't make sense, but in two years, this is what we're going to have, and that makes a ton of sense, then you can get a lot of people excited because it's go, something yeah. different. You have to go to first principles and remember like, all right, what are we trying to do here? If I buy real estate and then sell for more, I make money, mm -hmm. period. So like, it's get a napkin out, right? 110 a door. Oh, the property next door just sold for 145. These guys are listing at 165 and we're buying at 110 a door and we have 650 square foot one beds. Everyone else is at 400 square foot in this market. So we have the best product like physically and we're buying at 110 a door. It just needs some work. Like buy that yeah like the spreadsheet's important to understand especially when you're pitching bigger equity and like you have to understand going in cap rate you have to understand reversion cap rate you have to understand how much it's going to move annually but you also can't get caught in that like you have to come back out and get to the napkin and get simple again like you know warren buffett is like the most simple investor he also probably understands the all the granular stuff too but he always backs it out to like the simple like first principles thinking and i think that if you can't back it back out again then i don't think you really understand yeah it. taking that a step further it's you know you're buying it for 110 a door i think you guys are putting like eight to ten in right so your basis is 120 while you're cash flowing like people are paying rent even if it's just half so you're producing cash flow you're in at 120 and then you know when you look at the market comps, everyone's at 140 to 150. So you have 30,000 a door of spread there times 42 units. That's like 1.2 something million. It's like, hey, is this a good return on 1.9 in two years? If I if I invest 1.9 and in two years get 1.2 with cash flow and depreciation along the way, is that a deal I'm willing to do? And most people are going to say, yeah, I'll do that all day. Risk adjusted in a market like Austin, that's a home run, right? But the market doesn't, most people don't look at real estate that way they're going to say oh well in year one i only got four thousand dollars on my 1.9 million it's like you're not the next the this is not for you not yeah exactly year one. Oh, but i yeah. think that that's really important for the audience to understand is you know i started out duplexes fourplexes 10 20 unit buildings and no one would touch them and that's how you have to get started i think the one thing that i would say a word to the wise is you have to know the market you have to know that you can do the construction or be with someone that can Right, you can't just go into something and say, "I'm going to buy this asset no one wants to touch," and I've never done construction before, and I don't have someone on my team that knows it. You still have to be somewhat responsible and a fiduciary of, "Hey, I can do this, and here's how I'm going to do it," and put the team together. But I just think that you guys starting out and your first couple deals, it, they both look the same way, and we we'll, we can talk about the next one here. But that's that's the most important thing, right? Is you had you understood the market, you had an advantage there, and you guys had the people on your team that could execute the plan. But you're buying something that no one else really wanted to touch, right? And, which I and think is important know, to understand. That doesn't mean go buy anything in Austin because right. your risk of overpaying in Austin is going to be higher than other places. But like, if you do understand the market, if you do understand, if, if we've lived there, if we've seen Runberg, the street it's on, develop for 40 years, and we know what's going on. Okay, well, 22, 22 but like, years, uh, and, and we know what's going on. Like you said, that's what you have to do. You have to be creative because, like, I was listening to Kevin O'Leary talk. And uh, someone asked him, like, are you buying Mr. Multi Wonderful, Mr. Wonderful? And, and they're saying, Kevin, are you buying multifamily right now? And he's like, no, I'm not buying multifamily. It's a four cap. And I'm sitting there like, oh, Kevin O'Leary doesn't understand value add. He doesn't understand basis. And I'm like, well, think about it. Kevin O'Leary is not buying 42 unit stuff where you got to go put an elbow grease and cut your teeth and be 22 and like, you know, deliver great like equity multiple. Kevin O'Leary is buying 500 unit portfolios in a plus class. And so I'm thinking like, you have to understand where you're at and like, um, yeah, like you said, in Austin, we have an opportunity to buy for because institutions don't want to touch a 42 unit. Most people are too scared to touch a 42 unit. So that was like the perfect opportunity for us to jump in, add value. Um, like I said, we, we looked at it. We got the deal sent to us, off market, pocket listing, totally took it for granted. We were like, mm, I don't know. We don't want this, two cap, whatever. And then we go back and look at it and we're like, wait a second, these things are renting with two, three hundred under market, right? Like, so from the time you realized, hey, this is a good deal. When did you have it under contract? Yeah, we got it. So we got it sent to us in like, I think maybe January, February. Uh, a week after, didn't look at it for like a week or two. Next week, uh, broker says, hey, he'll buy this. He'll sell this thing tomorrow for four point seven. We put in the offer right there, four point seven, and then, uh, yeah. So the, the one of the things that excites me about the show, and you know, was working with guys like being able to meet men and women that are high school, college, maybe post-college and are like, forget going 
the route that my parents and everyone told me to go, which is go to school, get a degree, get a W-2 and blah, blah, blah. It's, hey, I'm going to go build something, create something. I'm going to bet on myself. Like one of my favorite lines from Kobe Bryant was, man, always bet on yourself. Always bet on yourself. You know what I mean? The one of the, you know, so I love it. And th- it really fires me up. So talk about the response after the show, kind of some of the people you were able to meet. Cause I, and I really want the audience to, uh, to get a couple nuggets from you guys of what's your advice to people that are, they're watching this and they're like, I want to be like those. I want to be like them. I want to be able to do the same thing. I'm 19. I'm a freshman at OU. I hate going to class. I love business. I really want to learn about building wealth. I am really drawn to real estate or maybe it's not real estate. Maybe it's private equity, maybe whatever it is, right? How are, how, what would be your advice to you guys back then on how to get partnered up, take some action and get on the path that you guys are on? I'd say do literally whatever you can. And I mean, the response from the first episode was hundreds and hundreds of people reaching out to us on all forms of social media. And like, we got to, I think almost every single one of them. Um, and so do reach out. I think that's step one, but step two is do literally whatever you can. I, when I started out, I cleaned up chairs, as you alluded to about the meetups, I would stack chairs and hand out name tags and check people in. I didn't want to do that. I thought I was too good for that, but like, I just did it. Right. And I think we all have a little ego about that, but if you can just do the work, I mean, we have Hudson here in the studio. He's 18. Yeah. Hudson, get over here. Yeah. Yeah. We, this guy reached out to me and van on Instagram. Uh, both of us. Hudson's been in the gym. I can tell. Yeah, he's, a, he's he, was, been, he knows his way around the gym. He was trying to be a Navy SEAL for a little bit there, but he basically said, I want to learn real estate. I don't know anything about filming, but I know you guys need someone to follow you around. I was like, you're want, you want to follow us around and film us do our life. And he's like, sure. I'm like, you think we're interesting enough to do that? He's like, I don't care. I'll do it. And we we're like, all right, come to Denver. So like now he's here in Denver. He's been hanging out with us and like seeing all behind the scenes stuff, filming some stuff. And I mean, like Hudson, do you even have a filming background, dude? He's like, hey, we might need someone to film. And I was Gave like, my GoPro. Oh, I filmed before. I was like, yeah, you can Say do that it. again and uh, oh, the, the mic saying, pick it up. Kyle had asked me when we went to lunch one time. He was like, yeah, we might need someone to film. I was like, oh, I can do it. I can totally film. Never picked up a camera in my life. Really. Say yes and figure it out yeah. later. I mean, that that's yeah. the So theme, Hudson, dude. you just reached out to him and said, hey, I want to get involved. I want to learn real estate. And I'll come work for you guys for free, whatever you guys need. Yeah, so I was watching episode or season one of this, like, this same podcast. And uh, I saw they were both like, you know, two dudes have $35 million worth of real estate at, I think it's like 22. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll watch this. Like, this list seems relatable. And I was like, oh, they're from Austin, Texas. I didn't even, I never told them, I never even finished the podcast. I just looked up their Instagrams, DM them, and then I was like, oh man, that's a shot in the dark. So I like, I went to Zion Capital's website, found his number, and sent him a text. And then before I know it, we were both at lunch. That's cool. And then now I'm on, De- now I'm in Denver. Yeah. So. Dude, I love Is it. Is it cool if I read yeah. the DM? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Hudson said, man, what's up? My name's Hudson. I was watching the bigger pockets, watch your video, working on getting my real estate license right now. I have no intention of going to college. Just wanted to talk to you about your story. And he was in Austin. So he noticed that I was in Austin too. Um, would love to buy you lunch, hear your story, get some wisdom. I'll be completely honest. I don't know about anything, but I got one hell of a work <laughs> ethic and I'm super ambitious and I'm looking to start and need someone to pour oh, into yeah. me. I just want to learn. That is like the, like, honestly, I just lit up. And what got your that. attention about that? Because you guys got hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of messages. What was it about that message that the audience can take from that, that got your attention? Well, this, this sounds weird, but it's because it was about me. It wasn't about him. It, it wasn't like, uh, hey, what should I do? Because like, I got a lot of DMs that are like, how should I reach out to brokers? And it's like, I don't know, figure it out. Like, it, it's just hard to answer a question like that. But Hudson said, hey, can I please get lunch and talk? And then. I texted him immediately and said, let's go get lunch. We got Chipotle like the next day. And I just listened to him talk for like 30 minutes. And I was just getting so fired up because I'm sitting there like this kid is a month behind me, but he's four years younger than me. And uh, and he was just talking about, you know, his his family life, his, his parents and how like the kind of culture about going to school and all of his friends going to college and stuff and actually seeing someone send it fully. Right. Seeing someone completely say, no, I'm not going to college. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but like, I'm going to figure it out. And like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to do something like it just fired me up. And I was like, dude, there is opportunity somewhere. And uh, yeah, now in the last just, I don't know, a couple of days, we've been like, you know, cultivating a pretty cool relationship. And like, I'm excited to just know Hudson. And I know that like, you know, we'll keep him while we can, but he's going to. Yeah, he's gonna. I he's love gonna it. Do that's great, man. Break that's, out of the cocoon. That's incredible. And, yeah. I love but, it. But that those are some great points here. I mean, obviously, reach out, take action. I mean, you guys have done that. I mean, Hudson's amazing proof from eight months ago, reach out, take action, be consistent, but tailor it to like, you know, you like, Hey, the person wants to reach out. You don't have those 
I mean, just horrible DMs like, what about this, what about that? Like, or try to add some value, be humble, be enthusiastic. Yeah. When people actually like review you, you know your content and they're enthusiastic, it's amazing. When it's like, dude, if you listen like five months of podcast, you would know that about me. Don't ask me the stupid question. Um, like do some homework, but like he, so he did all the right stuff. So listeners out there, that is an amazing way to just like, uh, dramatically increase your ability to go up there is just, you get some amazing mentorship. Yeah. And we're just guys too. Like me and Van are just regular people. So I think another big benefit is when he reached out, he just talked to us like people. Like the first time I had lunch with him, he's telling me the story that they had like a college day, he goes to a smaller high school in Austin and they are all wearing their college t-shirts like Duke and Princeton and Yale and all this stuff. And he comes in with a, a white t-shirt with a dollar sign thrown on it, <laughs> like a Sharpie. Oh my God. And like the teachers <laughs> trying to make him take it off, but he just came to school with a dollar sign on his shirt. And I was like, dude, I like that he's like, you you know, comfortable enough to just talk to me like a human being and tell me like that kind of a story. I, I get some calls where people are like being a little bit too, like I'm just a guy, man. Yeah. Just talk to me like a guy. I love it. Okay, so, so we're over time. Let's talk about the second episode that we're going to film. Chris, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we got to wrap up here because new format here for season two is we're going to wrap this interview up and we're going to head over to actually Terrence's office and you guys are going to pitch two investors on a deal. So it's gonna be, I don't know, be a little prep on your part, but it's for, we're trying to capture a real conversation, how it really goes. You're not up there, you know, with a PowerPoint, but it's gonna be a conversation. You're gonna give them some details and you're gonna be, you're gonna be questions fired at you. So we're gonna record it, we'll uh, discuss it, we'll break it down afterwards. It's gonna be a fantastic learning experience. Yeah, you're gonna be pitching two highly sophisticated institutional guys that have done hundreds of millions of dollars worth of deals. Uh, I've done a bunch of projects with them here. In my opinion, they're like two of the, hardest guys to get to like a deal but i think it'll be great for the audience great for you guys and i'm really excited to see how it turns out let's do it let's do it man all, all right, right cool. let's go you're listening to the multi-family mentor show join the conversation